We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and we acknowledge our continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. We'd also like to extend their respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. On item two, we have on leave Councillor Kuros. Uh, we do not have any other apologies this evening. Uh, members, I'd like to refer you to item three, confirmation of minutes of the meeting of the 2nd of July 2019. I'd seek a move of those minutes, moved by Councillor Sims. Can I please have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Canole. Uh, any discussion? Okay, be it that there's none, I'll put those to confirmation. All those in favour? All those against? Those minutes are carried. We'll move on to item four, um, consideration and recommendation to council with regards to strategic alignment uh, green, item 4.1. We have an item to deal with regulated tree removal in Tartania, Wama, part 26. And I look for a council member to move as recommended. Thank you, council member. No, I don't want to move. I want to ask, what, um, sorry, is, it, is the tree dead? So before I do that, I'll just seek um, so can we, is there anyone prepared to move this item? Thank you, moved by Councillor Donovan, seconded by Councillor Kira. Would you like to speak to your motion? Councillor Kira. Uh, simply the report that, um, for Councillor Moran's benefit, I guess, and everyone else, the report suggests it's very close to dead. Um, the photos show- Councillor, are you speaking to your motion? Well, I, I'll, I I'll take. So. I'm gonna take Councillor Moran's question on notice right now. Yeah, I, I can't resume my mind. Thank you. Councillor Moran, you have the floor. Well, I can see the picture. I haven't had a can look at it like? myself. Thank you. But this this is considered, I mean, more than bay figs are like um, elephants, aren't they? They take a long time to grow this big. Um, I can see it's been pruned. It's absolutely sure that um, this can't, I've seen the nurse back to health on the golf course. This is absolutely not going to not going to, are we sure that this can't be nursed? So, Councillor, I'll take that for you and I'll have the CEO respond. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, either Clinton or Kent, if you could respond to Councillor Kent. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, through the chair, um, <coughs> Councillor Moran, um, uh, we've uh, worked um, pretty we continue to work pretty closely with the management there. Uh, Damien Hoff is the head curator. <coughs> and, um, We've, uh, we've, we've got a good relationship. So we compare notes on these things all the time. Um, I wouldn't have brought it uh, before the, the council if, uh, if it wasn't required. Um, nobody wants to see such trees removed, but uh, at some point there is no choice. Councillor Moran, are you satisfied with the answer? Uh, not, Dr. Can I ask another question? Yes. Um, <coughs> I prefer, I only see, it, it is through you, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, is this a tree as it's dying? Um, maybe as it's done, posing any um, uh, dangerous danger. Well, it's adjacent uh, through the chair. Sorry, um, it's adjacent to the major path leading up to Pennington Terrace. There, yeah. um, the figs generally don't tend to fall apart and drop limbs, mm -hmm. but it is in a condition where, um, and uh, in the report, the uh, the arborist report. One of the recommendations was to install drainage to fix the underlying problem here. That work has been done. So the site is ready to receive a brand new tree and get new growth going and replace this, this one that's um, past the point of recovery, unfortunately. So that's why um, we're seeking approval to get the DA moving and get the tree out and then we can plant one back in, well, the SMA will plant one back in. Uh, as soon as it's removed. So, in your opinion, Kent, that there is uh, further um, um, husband <coughs> of this tree, um, would, is that a zero chance of success? Through the chair, yes, that's my opinion. Yes. Okay, thank you. Are you satisfied, Councillor Moran? I won't be voting for it, but I'm satisfied that I've received the information I need. Thanks. Thank you, Councillors. Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, uh, just Kent addressing that question of the drainage, which the document says has been the problem and led to the death of the tree. Is that drainage as a result of the work that the SMA, SMA has done in sealing that surface immediately around it? It appears on the photograph as though there's a lot of ash around there. Uh, through the chair, um, obviously the location is next to a fairly wide path there. 
that was installed to be DDA compliant when the redevelopment occurred. Um, the ground, um, not necessarily because of the, the bitumen, but grounds can be compacted just through foot traffic, uh, for example. Um, and what we can't see underground in this example um, has caught everybody unawares as such um, until this has occurred. Um, what we have done is, uh, as I said, uh, Mark Schamberg, our uh, lead arborist um, based at London Road, has worked closely with Damien at, uh, at the Oval. Uh, we've recommended how to manage their trees. They've put in programs as per our recommendations, which we apply everywhere else through the city. Um, but subsurface drainage or the need for it and the uh, knowing that a tree is is flooding itself underneath the ground is quite difficult until it's, in this case, too late. One other question. Um, uh, can we have an assurance that there will be a, a decent sized tree put in there and not a, a seedling from the bunnings? Yes, I've chased Damien about that and uh, he's getting the biggest one in the nursery that he can find, which I believe is about four metres. Good. Thank you. Councillors, any other any other questions with regards to this item? Would anyone like to speak for or against this item? Be it that there's none, I'll defer back to Councillor Donovan to sum up. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That item is carried. Uh, members, uh, it's just remiss of me, I've missed to acknowledge that this uh, committee meeting will be streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that any audio visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed, or published publicly by the council, including transferring outside of Australia. Moving on to item 4.2, uh, Rummel Park, uh, draft master plan, Park 14. Uh, we have a recommendation before us uh, to, uh, to council. If we're gonna have a councillor move that recommendation or seek to vary if required. Councillor Moran, moved. Seconded by the Lord Mayor. Councillor Moran. Uh, we'll look at the master plans go. It's fine. Actually, I have some problems with it. I don't endorse all of it, but uh, I think, as I said, as master plans go, this will do. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Uh, Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, Chair. I, uh, uh, I want to thank the admin for taking on our feedback. Um, you know, as, as uh, actually Councillor Moran said, there's probably not everything in there that uh, we need at the moment, but I'm very happy for it to go out to public consultation and get feedback on it. Um, but it's, uh, it's looking pretty good and, and I do thank you for listening to us during the last few meetings and um, incorporating that feedback into the plan. <coughs> So, Councillor Kira and then Councillor Sims. Thank you, Chair. I mean, is the amphitheatre still there? <laughs> uh, because I uh, asked because it appears in one diagram and not in another. Um, from my thank you, Grace. So much. Um, through the chair, um, we did take on the feedback around the um, the terminology that we use to describe the amphitheatre that was raised. Um, in discussion um, at the last committee in May, and um, the uh, the terminology that we have changed in the report um, um, has been um, has removed the amphitheatre and replaced that with informal terrace seating areas. So, is there a particular? So, so sorry. it's an amphitheatre with a different name. Is that right? Well, it's the same um, same the thing, same structure. <laughs> The connotation of the um, the word amphitheatre um, uh, is around a, an events focus, um, whereas um, what the intention of that space is is to create um, a social gathering area that has an outlook over the lake and um, may have the opportunity for informal smaller events, but that is not the focus of that space. Councillor Kira, you're all satisfied. Uh, Thank you, Councillor Simpson. Thanks, Chair. Just a point of clarification. I think one of the issues that was raised um, when we talked about this previously was the presentation of the uh, park or wetland approach. 
And I think there was some discussion about that being presented for public consultation as an either or, rather than the two being combined. It wasn't clear to me whether that's been taken up in the revised document, ha has it been? Uh, yes, it has. Sorry, through the chair. Yes, Great. it has. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, just two questions of clarification. At 7.16, um, it says the consultation on the plan will occur at the same time the community land management plan is reviewed. Is there anything on the draft master plan that is at odds with the community land management plan? Because it would seem um, inconsistent to go out uh, and consult before you've actually done it and got the, CM, uh, the CLMP. <laughs> Um, the um, there's we see the the descriptions in the CLMP um, that um, would require consultation um, would be around the ornamental lake and whether um, whether it becomes a, a wetland or stays an ornamental lake. The CLMP um, refers to that. Uh, that lake and the original design of that space is being um, one of the values to be retained in that space. The second item is the play space, which in the CLMP calls up as is called up as a renewal or um, upgrade to the play space where, with the Quentin Kennaham play space, where um, we're looking at. Um, not just upgrading, but creating a new space in that area. Um, uh, and your question around consultation, um, we are looking to consult um, concurrently on the master plan and on the CLMPs um, and prioritise the CLMP review of Rival Park, Melbourne, Perka as a priority with um, the IBP projects. So, Okay, but it, it means we're actually going out to, to consult on the draft master plan and the community land management plan says they're not actually included. Um, so we're going to undertake that consultation concurrently to the review of the CLMP. So the consultation on the master plan will also be um, the consultation that's required on the CLMPs. Just through the uh, CEO, Shanti, did you want to expand on that? Through the chair, um, the intent, um, Councillor Martin, is to ensure that um, what we're consulting on on the on the master plan is reflected in a revised CLMP, and to do those concurrently. <coughs> no, I understand that. I, it, it, uh, it just occurred to me that it was a bit odd that we were going out. Well, well this council tonight is approving a draft master plan, which is at odds with the CLMP for consultation, um, whereas I would have thought we'd have, you know, gone out and corrected the community land management plan and then put forward a draft master plan. That's, that's my only point. Through, through the chair, um, there's been some recent case law um, around um, CLMPs and, and master plans, and we've taken advice on that and to ensure that um, we're not tripped up on a legal matter, we need to make sure that the two run in parallel with one another. Okay, okay. Um, and my second question uh, relates to um, some uh, contradiction or rate uh, uh, claimed uh, uh, to see in the document. Um, the, uh, the new inclusive play space uh, includes under the heading 2.3, introduce flexible and appropriate parking, page 31. Um, it suggested to me it's ambiguous for us to be saying potential additional accessible car parking and bus and coach drop off pickup zones capacity and configuration associated with the inclusive play space to be further investigated. And then at page 17, we say accessible car parking only will be included within the park. Which is it? Through the chair, um, based on um, feedback that we received at the last committee meeting and also from APLA around um, the um, the lack of clarity around what the approach to car parking would be for the play space. We provided um, 
an update, an amendment to the report to um, to discuss the approach to only including accessible car parks within Rangel and only if there are no other alternatives for on-street um, car parking. Oh, okay. No, well, that's fine. I wonder if the administration could give us an undertaking then mm -hmm. that the reference of page 31 to include bus and coach drop off pickup zones and so on will be removed from the consultation document. Um, can I provide clarification on just that item yes. around um, the bus oh, and drop yep. off, off area? Um, so the intent for, for that area was to, um, to investigate opportunities for on-street um, bus and drop off areas um, as a requirement for the inclusive play space to um, to enable uh, schools and um, uh, groups to to come to the play space and the approach would be to investigate the location along Decairville but within the park not within the play yeah. space okay well no that's fine then um, could we have an undertaking from the administration that it will be amended to say on street because the way it reads, it reads as though it's in the play space. Yep, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other discussions? Okay, I'll refer back to the mover, Councillor Moran. Thumbed up. I'll put that to you. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Thank you, members. <coughs> Moving on to item 4.3, Harness Street Improvement Project. I can have a mover, Councillor Sims, seconded by Councillor Abraham Zeta. Go ahead, Councillor. Thanks, Chair. Um, look, I wanted to uh, commend administration on this. I think this is a good piece of work. Um, and we've talked about this uh, in committee previously, and there was a debate about whether we should wait for the master plan um, process. My view has always been that we should nail down some of the quick wins initially because there are some real issues um, in the area um, and then you know, look at some of the long term um, issues. And I think lots of the things that have been um, recommended here as part of the improvement project are really good. I um, particularly welcome the reduction in speed limits. Um, my view has always been that that should be um, across the board in residential areas. Um, in the city, and you know, I'll continue to advocate for that. Um, but I think this is a good start in terms of um, improving pedestrian safety. So I encourage people to support this. Councillor Brenzo. Thank you. Um, I've got one uh, question. Um, on Friday nights and Saturday nights, the intersection of Morford Street and Ivy Street gets fairly busy. So we have a fair bit of uh, foot traffic in that, uh, at that intersection. Um, I wanted to see whether if it's at all worthwhile looking at a scramble crossing for that intersection. Through the chair, we have Amy and Mason here to help us respond. Could you help us? Through the chair, thank you. Um, so thank you for your question regarding the scramble crossing. Um, I can uh, update that the proposal to install such a crossing, crossing at the intersection of Piney and Morpheus Street is not supported by the administration. And the reasons for this are Scramble crossings are known to increase delays for pedestrians to cross the road and would likely result in more pedestrians crossing against the traffic signals. Some work's been done with traffic signal reviews in this project. Uh, scramble crossings change the traffic signal phase patterns and would have significant uh, impacts on peak hour traffic movement. Um, and scramble crossings reduce the green time for vehicles and therefore reduce overall throughput of vehicles there. And finally, pedestrian volumes do not warrant such a scramble crossing at that location outside of the late night peak periods. And scramble crossings, sadly, they're not, um, they can't be simply installed during set periods of time. They're actually quite a large undertaking. So um, I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes, it does. Thank you. Any other comments or questions, Councillor? Lord Mayor. Um, thank you. Uh, could I just ask in terms of how long the trial for that closure for the right hand turn on the way into the office? So. Uh, how long the trial? Because we're going to do a pilot, aren't we? Yes. Uh, how long does that, is that going to go for? Yeah. So uh, the moment we've got here, eight week trial. Eight week trial. And, yeah. and the assessment at the end of that trial? 
is um, that going to be with the, the normal stakeholder group, so the police, the West End Association, the... Uh, through the JDS it would be. Yeah. And, and the local businesses as well? Um, yes, so onto that, as the CEO working group has been established and yeah. Amy is the lead for external communication, so each of these wins and actions would be communicated directly through the relevant um, stakeholder groups. And could I ask in terms of the uh, length of time for the pilot for Bank Street and Rosina Street closures? Uh, is that sort of, because it's a pilot as well, is that going to be a couple of months? Uh, we don't actually, through the chair, we don't actually have a, a length of the trial for Bank and Rosina Street closures, but we can get, get back to that. Okay, could bring, you, bring could you let us yeah, know? I mean, I'm assuming we're piloting it, so yep. it would be a two, three month period and then a review. Yeah, through you, Chair. Um, yeah, we've um, costed it up and we um, would imagine it'd be about three months to give it a good chance to see how it goes, but the same um, would apply that it would go back through the um, Lord Mayor's Roundtable or through our stakeholders at like DSAPOL um, and report back before any uh, major changes. Um, I have one. Can I go ahead? So, um, as a just a little uh, an upside, a bit of feedback, um, I did a, a big walk around Hindley. Um, about two weeks ago and stopped and talked to a lot of the traders. Um, some of the feedback <coughs> in just changing over the banners in Heimer Street, they thought that was great. And even that, that small thing, because those banners have been there a long time, um, um, particularly imprints and a few of those traders that were open on Sunday uh, wanted to say thank you. They thought that was a, a great move on behalf of council just to upgrade that. Um, the other one is around the street closures um, and um, I'm going to look at 90 because one of the things that we were hoping to trial through Splash was alternate ways to close the streets as opposed to putting up the big plastic orange and white things. Um, can we also look at that and, and you may need to come back to us with a, a different budget allocation, but can we look at a different way of closing those streets so that we can use uh, planter boxes or something that is sort of aligned at the curb so that you've still got the flow through, flow through traffic behind it um, rather than actually using the sort of normal way with the flashing lights and the volatility things. Through you, Chair, yes, certainly. That would be great, thank you. Councillor Kerr. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, the speed limit uh, reduction, uh, it looks like it's what's proposed a trial of blanket um, speed limit reduction at all times, is that correct? Yeah. Is there a reason, is, is, yeah, obviously there is. Um, is there a reason we didn't, we aren't trialling a speed limit reduction on the on the key peak hours, Friday and Saturday nights in particular? Through the chair, we would generally trial a generalised speed reduction for the <coughs> length of time, so 24 hours, seven days a week, and that would align with the current speed limit, which is on the western side of Morford Street, so it provides a motorist with a consistent approach through uh, the entire section of Hindley Street all the way to Kingley. Thanks. Um, would you acknowledge, though, there's a difference between the main thoroughfare at Hindley Street and the section you've just um, you've just suggested is a, is a reason for the continuation? That is that the section uh, west of Morford Street is essentially is pretty much a de facto uh, student campus. Um, now, this is clearly not the case with Hindley Street itself. Uh, Hindley Street itself, you've got during the day uh, for most of the week, you've got retail and office um, as, as the bulk of the tenancies there, the bulk of the work. And moreover, I don't see that the need for, uh, well, moreover, the volume of people on Hindley Street, the main drag, during the daytimes is quite different to that western section. Is that correct? They are different street conditions, you are correct. Um, we have undertaken two speed reviews on Hindley Street, uh, one close to Bank Street and one further down near the HDI Club. And the average speeds during day and night is below 30 kilometres an hour. And the 85th percentile, sorry, 85% of vehicles travelling along the street are around 30 to 35 kilometres. So already um, throughout the day, we do have a speed limit that is conducive of 30 kilometres an hour. 
Jeez. Sorry, just to clarify on that, the, the average speed being undertaken by vehicles outside of Friday and Saturday nights, or is that average figure, does that average figure derive from including the Friday and Saturday nights as well? Uh, so Friday and Saturday nights are obviously a lot slower, um, but the average, we do have an average for the weekday and do have an average for the evening, and the weekday average is around that 25 to 30 kilometres an hour. And if I find it hard to leave a truck cars just doing 30 kilometres an hour during the week, um, you know, four o'clock on a Monday afternoon. But anyway, my last question is about Rosina Street, um, the closure of that street. Um, it's one way, isn't it? So will that mean that uh, the, Res the Rosina Street car park will not be able to be accessed? Yes, so through the share, Rosina Street is one way. I believe that there is some other access off uh, the other side streets accessible from uh, Curry Street where that Rosina Street car park could be accessed and uh, the closure may, would have to investigate exactly where that closure would be to see uh, access into and out of that car park. So, so this trial closure will, it will only be undertaken if we ensure that the Rosina Street car park is still accessed obviously on Friday and Saturday nights? Through the chain, yes, that would definitely be the case. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Hogan. Um, just quickly, I want to echo Rob's sentiment. This is a, a great piece of work that you guys have done here. I'm really keen to see the results. Um, uh, just, just to clarify on the on the speed um, thing. So, the, the, most people are going slow anyway. So we're not really actually going to achieve that much by taking it down to forty. Thirty. Thirty. Through the chair, the ability to install a thirty kilometre an hour speed limit does. Uh, restrict some of those vehicles that are travelling um, above that speed at, at particular times of the night to try and improve safety. So, for example, when the street is clear, um, vehicles can obviously travel up to 50 kilometres an hour, but when it's congested, obviously they're going a lot slower. But it's not going to make any more congestion because at peak times it's already gone. So no, it won't make any more congestion. Thank you, councillors. Any other? Sorry, councillor Hill. Um, just a couple of observations that we had from our, our walk uh, on Sunday morning um, and one of the concerns that were from the encounter youth group is that I mean the speeds over the uh, the bridge you know because they're running from a 60 into a 50 and into that intersection uh, can be quite you know an issue and it has created a number of times where people have been injured and that's something we can consider. Um, what we also noticed a lot was that the traffic up and down the street was mainly taxis and uh, so that is, the, you know, and there are obviously taxi ranks and all the rest of it. And uh, very much around that was um, if you wish to uh, uh, keep it so that the, the taxis or the Ubers, etc., can access closer to the venues so that people are clearing, uh, you know, quicker to, and, and closer to where they're coming out of. That also helps to do, decrease the amount of incidences where people can interact with each other and not necessarily positively. Um, and uh, when I'm looking at that, I mean, uh, the, the art and things like that, the, uh, certainly is a, is a very, um, you know, will help with things, but uh, the facilities and that, and we talk particularly around the toilets and things like that on Produce Lane, etc. I mean, they're a place that, that are necessary, but people <coughs> avoid using simply because it's not conducive to, you know, a, 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 to safe access, etc. And, you know, maybe, I don't know, for the, con the compromise between, you know, uh, improving the, the, the look uh, and improving an, an amenity that is certainly really critical, considering it's one of the main uh, issues that uh, you know, people have by um, you know, doing uh, things in, in places they shouldn't, um, would be quite useful. Um, and uh, we also had a bit of comment in regards to, and it doesn't really relate to yours, is that the, the Shisha uh, outlets, um, there is, uh, you know, they're, they're considered uh, uh, the, the smoking, etc. in those is quite, the smoke is quite uh, potent and uh, people are walking through those areas so it is about how do we can how do we control you know the seating areas where they're smoking and where previously it was food uh, food outlets now it's specifically for this uh, activity which means that people are walking through there um, you know are, are, have to interact with, with quite strong smoke apparently it's 50 times more potent than a cigarette um, so, you know, so how can we, you know, again, uh, look after the, the street and look after those sort of uh, uh, situations there? Um, how about that one? <coughs> and I think that covers the main issues. Thank you. You had one second left on the clock. <laughs> <laughs> That's German engineering.
Perfect. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, members, any other discussion or questions to administration? Councillor Sims. Just to cap off, um, I think this really is about improving community safety um, and, as we've heard, um, changes to uh, speed limits um, are not going to have a terrible impact on traffic, but they will um, improve safety for the community. Um, so, look, I encourage everybody to um, get behind this and, and make some um, changes. In terms of the right turn um, issue, I'm always keen to see more people turning left in our city. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. I'll put this to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? No, it's carried. We'll uh, move on to the following item, item 4.4. Uh, members, um, as you're probably aware, we've got a significant agenda um, ahead of us today. What I'm proposing to do with both item 4.4 and 4.5 is that we move a procedural motion, if you wish, so that the council deals with these items anyway, because those items and those appointments need to be done by council anyway, when it comes to the LGA and also the FLGA at the second item of 4.5. So uh, if someone would like to move a procedural motion with that regard, so moved by Councillor Hyde, seconded by the Mayor. Any debate? Any questions? So they'll be deferred to the council. All those in favour? All those against? That item has been now deferred to council. Item 4.5, similarly, if I can get a uh, procedural motion to deal with that item to defer to council, moved by Councillor Hyde, seconded by the Lord Mayor. Any discussion? I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Councillor Moran, are you ready? <coughs> Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the following item, the 4.6, a 20-year infrastructure strategy discussion paper. We have a recommendation before us to endorse attachment A. Uh, you happy to move, Councillor? No, I'm moving an alternative motion. Okay, so happy to take that from you. Uh, uh, after the words, uh, 20, uh, the number 2019, a comma. Yep. Um, with the deletion of support for private investment and value capture in infrastructure. <coughs> but uh, value capture? Capture. <laughs> capture. You said value, right? Value, yeah, value, value. without the idea. Yeah, value capture. Um, just for, uh, to assist the uh, committee Councillor, which, where is that item located in the papers? Uh, it's on page uh, 85 and it is attachment A and it proposes that council supports private investment. Little priority has been given uh, to date in the rollout of new planning system on understanding new infrastructure tools. Utilisation of value capture and developer contributions could also be done better in SA. So I have a mover in that. What I might, um, I might get a clarification from administration to why that was included in the first place. They seek a seconder for your motion, councillor. Well, why don't we have a seconder and then if administration sure. wishes to speak, so they can. Councillor, uh, councillor Sims is happy to second your motion. Do you want to speak to your motion first or get a response first? Oh, I'm happy for the administration to speak first. Okay, excellent. So Shanti, if you don't mind, you want to speak. Um, the intent um, with providing um, support for um, private investment and value capture is um, essentially to refocus attention of who pays for um, infrastructure, whether it's uh, soft infrastructure or um, hard infrastructure, um, and recognising the value that the private sector has to pay in that space, number one. Um, and secondarily, uh, when new development occurs, um, recognising that new development creates a rate space which um, traditionally um, governments are not terribly um, um, well equipped to um, understand the value of that development in the context of a forward plan and framework. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, would you like to speak to your motion, to your amendment? Or recommendation, sorry. Yeah, sure. May I just preface my remarks by saying um, uh, that I, I, I'm not sure who prepared this document, 
Um, it would be good if there was a bit more in the document about social infrastructure, particularly where we already have positions on a number of things, but uh, we're pretty silent about whether we want education facilities, primary, secondary. There's no mention uh, about things like indoor velodromes. There's a, a motion of council on record supporting an indoor velodrome. There's no mention of that. No mention about uh, transport in the context of trains. We have a position on interstate trains coming into the railway station, that sort of stuff. Um, there's no mention of uh, tram loops or anything of that nature in the infrastructure document. And, and we have motions uh, already at council on that. Um, there's no mention of bus stations or transport movements in Grenfell Street, for example, which is part of our strategic plan, but which is not referenced in this document. Um, and uh, we don't have anything there about roads, whereas we have a position on uh, ring routes around the city and how that would operate, but there's no mention of that in there. However, uh, my particular concern, oh, and there's nothing about the park lands over here, by the way, which is important too, but my particular point is about uh, support for private investment and value capture in infrastructure. Value capture is, of course, the uh, the concept that was first advanced by uh, Malcolm Turnbull, one of our former prime ministers, one of our many former prime ministers in recent years. Um, and the concept is essentially, in simple terms, that if you are a property owner and there is private, uh, uh, sorry, public infrastructure rolled out in front of your property, then you actually benefit and you are expected to make a contribution. Now, the concept's never really been fully developed to my satisfaction, but basically it means that if you benefit, you pay uh, in one way or another, uh, either through a council imposing uh, rates or a government imposing a surcharge. Now, I don't think uh, coming from a ward where we're absolutely looking forward to a tram rolling past our doors that my rate payers, businesses and residents are going to be happy about this council supporting the concept of value capture as a consequence. And the other objectionable aspect from my point of view is that we also uh, countenance the possibility of private investment in public infrastructure, which is what this is all about. And uh, the reverse side of that is that whenever private enterprise invests in public infrastructure, it must have a dividend. And for example, if it's a road, it's a toll. Now, I don't think we as a council should be putting ourselves in any kind of position where we endorse those kinds of uh, views, which ultimately lead to uh, imposts on our rate payers. It is another way of raising taxation. Um, I'd like to propose that we ignore this. Um, public uh, infrastructure privatisation is a very touchy subject in this state, uh, and, and I'm aware that the uh, state government has only recently talked about privatising the public uh, transport system, uh, having this council then talk about privatising roads or introducing tolls or new taxes for public infrastructure is, uh, in my view, inappropriate. And I would ask that members support the deletion of that from this document. Thank you, Councillor. Um, just to deal with the first part of your debate, you referenced points that weren't included in the document in your debate. Is, are these items you want them to be included? Because they're not obviously reflected in your amendment. Oh, no, no, I understand that. And look, if the administration takes that on board, that would be great if, you know, some of the previous resolutions of the council were included in the, mm -hmm. the document by way of reference, that would be great. Thank you. Councillor Sims. Thanks, uh, Chair. Like um, Councillor Martin, I have real concerns around uh, privatisation of public infrastructure. Um, as Councillor Martin said, we are having a debate at the moment around um, the privatisation of our train and trams network. Um, and I don't think we should be opening the door to privatisation of public infrastructure. And I'm concerned to see that being included in the infrastructure strategy. So I think removing those um, uh, removing that makes it very clear to the community that we're not open to um, the privatisation agenda being extended to council. Lord Mayor. Thank you, Chair. I was just going to ask for a response from Edwin on um, uh, on that in terms of uh, the in the interpretation of that particular um, bullet point within the agreement. <coughs> 
Um, thank you, Lord Mayor, through the Chair. Um, I'd just like to clarify um, for Council, and I reference um, page 80 of your uh, paperwork, specifically paragraph 2.3, um, where the discussion paper actually defines uh, infrastructure uh, to be the physical assets and structures that enable the services necessary to sustain or enhance the economy and livability of South Australia. This includes road, rail, ports, health, cultural sports, tourism, education facilities, energy, water, waste, utility, uh, utilities. It also includes digital con connectivity infrastructure and other physical assets that can enable industry and other sectors of the economy. Why I refer you to that particular paragraph is um, the way we read this discussion paper is that it is intended to capture soft and hard infrastructure. So um, that's the first thing. So um, the other thing for clarification purposes is that um, this is merely a discussion paper. It's not a strategy. Um, uh, it is, it's, it's intended to get the conversation piece um, started uh, in the community. Um, infrastructure South Australia is required under its legislation to provide an infrastructure strategy. And so um, the preparation of this discussion paper is essentially the starting point um, to enable it to then go forward and actually prepare a infrastructure strategy or an infrastructure strategy um, for the state. Um, the discussion paper literally floats a whole bunch of ideas, one of which is, you know, what are the opportunities for the private sector to be involved in providing infrastructure. Now, whether that is a question of privatisation or whether that is a question of a partnership type arrangement with government to provide infrastructure, or if we were to use some of the examples that we have here in the city where the private sector is directly involved in actually creating infrastructure um, where it undertakes development. So it covers a raft of private type investment in infrastructure and whether that's privatised in the manner that we understand privatisation to exist or, is that, or whether that's private investment in the form that something is handed over to government, it covers that full gamut of opportunities. So it's not, um, it's not intended to capture privatisation in the context of, say, privatisation of our electricity infrastructure as we know it. Thank you, Chancellor. Lord Mayor, the floor's yours. That's fine. That's fine. Any other questions? Councillor Hyde. Um, I'll, I'll speak against this amendment. I think um, I think there's a little bit of fear that's been been whipped up here, as as administration highlighted. Um, we're not talking about privatisation. No one's talking about privatisation except the people moving the amendment. But um, uh, what we are talking about value capture. Um, we're talking about complementary investment. It's, there's no one's going around saying that um, oh, the government's going to start building toll roads or anything like that. I think it's quite absurd. South Australia's roundly rejected that sort of infrastructure. What we're talking about is taking a holistic view, and as, as was highlighted, infrastructure South Australia is not only looking at the government built infrastructure, they're also looking at private sector infrastructure so we can get a proper a proper view um, of everything that we have at our disposal regardless of whether it's user pay or not. Um, and so to, to, to go in and at the outset rule out the idea of value capture, um, the idea of uh, working with your stakeholders, um, uh, I, I think is um, roundly absurd. So um, I would implore members to, to keep that, um, keep reference to, to value capture and um, and develop contributions in there. It's what is done um, interstate in bigger cities, larger cities, um, places that uh, uh, are doing infrastructure. Well, traditionally they haven't done it that well, but they're starting to do it better. And they're starting to do it better because they're working with the owners of shopping centres to, to put a train station underneath it. And that really helps the movement of people and everything like that. That requires public-private partnership. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's inherent because the government doesn't own everything. We're working with people that own land um, and we have to work with them. So I would implore members to not support this amendment and support the motion in its original uh, form. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Any other councillor? Councillor Cannon. Um, no, I think uh, I, I 
can pick other sentiments as well. Simply, we've been having a conversation with a few uh, people around, uh, you know, who have a few ideas on how we can, as council, work together and use, uh, you know, private infrastructure in which we can also uh, enable the council to be involved. And it's just a few ideas. And uh, the point is, is that you don't necessarily want to exclude that. Uh, you know, because there it's about enabling them to provide uh, a space that we can use and we can get, uh, gain value out of, and uh, whether it be for communal or whether it be for council for its own infrastructure to be able to deliver things, or even to that degree have another sustainable uh, form of income. Um, and I think we have a we have a construction happening, uh, you know, in Goodwin and Grove Street, where it's a, it's a mixed uh, uh, in a partnership, uh, delivering uh, you know outcomes for the for the uh, council and for the community, but also being done through the uh, you know the ability for a private business to uh, to get value out of that extra space. Um, and I think we certainly it's important that we don't uh, you know uh, we are considerate about these things. Um, but it, we do need to first have an open conversation so that we do get to a point where we say, well, what is in public benefit? What is it that is going to minimise our costs and expenses and still deliver enhanced outcomes for the community? Because we as a council need to find other forms of, of income and, and uh, you know, amenity as well. Thank you, Councillor Carl. Any other remarks? Councillor Dolan. Likewise, I don't support this amendment because I think we need to keep the conversation open. Um, there are some excellent local, interstate, international examples where private partnerships have, have led to some excellent outcomes, even where um, through publicly uh, crowdfunded ideas that have led to bridges in, uh, in Europe that have been an excellent outcome. So I think at this point of the conversation, we need to keep it open to all possibilities. So I would not support this amendment. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. Councillors, any other remarks or questions? If there's none, I'll hand the floor back to Councillor Martin to sum up. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm not sure about which project Councillor Canol was referring to in Goody or Grove Street. May I ask first what it is? Um, Councillor, that's okay. I cannot. <coughs> With regards to? What, what the project he was Central referring Market to in Goody. Okay. Central Market Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, well, that's, um, uh, that's not a, a, a private public venture. That's a council venture engaging a private industry organisation to construct something. That's quite different to what's proposed here. This is actually about private investment in public infrastructure. Like, for example, happens in other places to which uh, uh, Councillor Hyde referred. For example, the train line between uh, um, uh, at Sydney Airport in the city. Uh, that was a private enterprise project uh, built under government auspices. And uh, on my last journey, the tax for using that railway station, not the fare, the tax was $18. Now, that is the outcome of privatisation of public infrastructure. That is what this council is endorsing if it endorses this document. It's saying to the government, we think this is a pretty good idea. I don't think it's a very good idea at all. And moreover, to be specifically using the words value capture, when even our federal politicians have difficulty in articulating what it is, except for agreeing that it involves taxing people who benefit from public infrastructure because it passes by their door, is to my mind, in incredibly provocative. I would have thought that business in this city would be horrified at the prospect that every time there is to be some improvement to public infrastructure, it will go straight through to their, <coughs> their, their wallets. Um, it's a really sad outcome for us philosophically to be endorsing that point of view. It says to the government, the government, by the way, which only uh, a few weeks ago announced it was privatising uh, the transport network, it says to the government, we're on the same page and, and I'm not. Thank you, Councillor. I will put that amendment to the vote. All those in favour of Councillor Martin's amendment? All those against? That is lost. We go back to the original uh, recommendation. Do I have a mover? Councillor Ibrahim Zeta, do I have a seconder? Councillor Hyde, is there further debate on this topic? Councillor Ibrahim Zeta to sum up. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. <coughs> Members, we move on to the following item.
Item 5.5, the review of event noise mitigation standard operating procedures. This is a workshop and there will be an opportunity for council members to receive an update on the review of the council event noise mitigation standard operation procedures and proposed changes prior to undertaking a final round of external consultation on the revised SOPs. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Please go ahead. How long do you need for the presentation? Uh, Chair, we probably need about half an hour. Excellent. If, if that. So I think we are. So I think the intent just for no need to um, give you some context and background as to uh, why we are here tonight, and that will only take a few minutes. Only. And then depending on the level of feedback from um, each of you, that will depend on the length of time it takes. So back to you. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Claire, for the clarification. You just, you just got <laughs> <laughs> I thought you meant the total duration. <laughs> um, thanks, Claire. Um, as Claire mentioned, we are here this evening to uh, provide you with an overview of the a review that we've undertaken on the noise mitigation standard operating procedures. However, I just will refer to those as the guidelines, otherwise it's a mouthful. Um, members, those are in your papers, and can I just confirm that you're happy to take those as read? Yes. Thank you. Um, my colleague Adam has joined me this evening also to respond to any questions that might be a bit more technical in nature. Um, so for your information, the current guidelines were developed in 2014 um, and since the inception of those guidelines, the city really has continued to develop and evolve. Um, since then, in 2016, the Adelaide Parkland Event Management Plan, or as we fondly call it, the EPLEN, was endorsed by council and this document really provides a framework for council, the community and events to um, understand how to hold events within our parkland spaces. Um, the EPLEMP identifies 27 parkland event sites within our city that can be used for a range of events um, and activities throughout the year. So since 2016 and the inception of the guidelines in 2014, we have seen an increase in events being held within the city and within the parkland spaces. So this really has become evident that we need to look at how we can align the guidelines um, more succinctly with the plan um, and the framework that is established through that document. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so, members, in 2018, uh, October 2018, we commenced a review of the guidelines and the key outcomes that we were seeking to achieve from this review was to provide a clear and consistent um, advice to our customers, be responsive to the noise sensitivities of our parklands and the surrounding areas and also to continue to be a great city that, to host events. Um, the review has entailed consultation with our city community, including businesses and residents, engagement with event organisers and internal stakeholders. But in addition to this, we also um, engaged an acoustic engineer to undertake a review of our noise guidelines, but also to undertake modelling in uh, various parkland event sites to determine the suitability of certain types of events for those spaces. Um, as part of that work, um, we've also developed plans around specific locations for staging or um, sound systems to be located. So following tonight's workshop, the plan is to uh, re-engage with the community and various stakeholders on the guidelines and then bring those into the uh, council for your consideration in September this year. So I think it's important to note that here in the city, we have a really unique offering with 27 parkland event sites. Um, which are surrounded by businesses and residents. To our knowledge, there is no other um, 
capital city within Australia, or maybe even the world, that has this offering available within their city. Um, we do host a huge variety of events annually, um, and this really works out to more than two events held in our parkland spaces per week. Um, so it's important that through this review we strike um, a balance that enables the city to continue to host events, attract new events, but also meet the needs of our key stakeholders like businesses and residents. So the changes that we're proposing within the guidelines have been informed through a number of things. Um, the experience with using the event sites over the past few years, particularly since the development of the plan, testing the use of parkland event sites that haven't traditionally been used for the hosting of events. Um, we've also been able to great, gain, as well as our event customers, a greater understanding of what's possible and also what's <coughs> not within those sites. Um, and we've also received a lot of feedback from various stakeholders throughout the number of years within the event seasons as well. And most recently, the feedback that we've received through the uh, consultation on the guideline review. So what we're proposing, what we're hoping that we're proposing through the guidelines is that we will continue to have a really well-balanced approach to the management of noise from events within the city, but also be able to work with our customers to program events that are suitable for specific event sites, so those being the 27 that are identified through the plan. Um, it's also just worth noting or remembering that any new event that is uh, proposing to operate past midnight within the city, it is a requirement of the appliance that that is brought forward to council for your consideration. Um, and at that time, there is an opportunity to add additional conditions to that event approval process if so required. So there are a number of key findings um, from the review, which we've we've gathered along the years, but also as part of the feedback we've received, that there's an opportunity with these guidelines um, for our customers to be, for our customers to find it easier to do business with us. Um, we're able to provide more specialist device now around the work that we've, uh, the acoustic engineer has undertaken for us. Um, there's more flexibility within the guidelines. Um, so we're now, the way in which we're proposing that the guidelines um, are structured that we can hopefully attract more national touring events to the city. Um, the guidelines will hopefully be clearer for our event customers to understand and adhere to, um, and also looking at the different um, noise sensitive areas and how we manage those and the uh, sound emissions coming from events. So based on this, there are a number of um, key changes that we're proposing and we'll be seeking your feedback on. So these are clearer requirements for road events. Um, the revised amplified sound requirements for four of the parkland event sites. Um, new and improved um, requirements for noise, bond and monitoring of sound throughout those events. Um, as I mentioned, we're hoping that this will provide clearer and more consistent advice to event organisers and more controlled flexibility, as I mentioned, for events with headline acts. So that's, that really talks to some of those national touring events. Um, we hope that and feel that the proposed changes um, to the guidelines will provide a balanced approach and will enable not only our events, but our customers to experience the great city that we have. So members will now um, seek your feedback on one question, which is, and it's on the screen, uh, do members support the proposed changes to the event noise mitigation standard operating procedures? Thank you for your presentation. I'll open up the floor for questions to uh, our administration and also if uh, elected members have got any feedback to provide, uh, the uh, administration will take that on board. So I've got up with Councillor Donovan. I'm sure I've got a few councillors and then followed by Councillor Hyde, councillors. Thank you. Um, overall, I think, first of all, just looking at the numbers, it looks like event numbers have gone up by 55%, but uh, complaints have only gone up by 15%. So I think, first of all, those numbers are looking pretty good. Um, uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, Light Square was differed in terms of the timing, all the other zones finished by midnight, whereas Light Square was 1am. What was the rationale there? 
part of the rationale was to try and align certain squares. So light square was later pulling it back, in our opinion, won't affect any of our current customers or events, and just speaks to the developing nature around the square as well. So um, it, it was an easy uh, pullback to, uh, without any, any uh, repercussions on the current events, basically. In the sense that all of the other um, timings have been pulled back to midnight, whereas Light Square is 1am. So I appreciate it is still a pullback, but why is it 1am rather than midnight? It's still, in our opinion, sits within the West End precinct and uh, to have pull it back to the 1am um, just provides, provides that extra hour that we don't think will uh, unduly impact uh, stakeholders in that precinct. Have there been any complaints for the, because there is a, a bit of an increase in residential um, yeah, acknowledging that area, and yeah. also uh, just in the last 12 months it hasn't been tested, we haven't had an event that has applied or had an interest in running past midnight. So. Okay, um, and just on that same note, apart from things like Fringe, New Year's Eve, um, Adelaide Festival, are there many events that currently do apply for a licence beyond midnight, just across the city? Uh, excluding those ones that uh, through the chair, excluding those ones that you mentioned, no, no, there isn't. So it won't affect many if they're adhering to their uh, agreed timings anyway. Um, okay, yeah, that's all my questions. Thanks. That's all serious. Thank you. Um, a few questions. Uh, one of the issues that's sometimes been raised with me by residents is a lack of awareness around when events are going to be on. You know, sometimes that people are particularly aggrieved if they hear a lot of noise if they're not expecting it. And, you know, if you're aware that there's going to be a big festival or a big event on, you might plan your schedule a little bit differently. Has there ever been consideration of an app or something put up online that might give residents, you know, information so that they can plan? And if that's mentioned in here, I'm sorry if I missed it. Uh, through the chair, uh, yes, uh, we have um, responded to feedback from residents and businesses um, and this latest summer event season that we had, we developed a dashboard that was placed on our City of Adelaide website and also promoted quite heavily um, through our comms team, um, which provided real-time information about the location of events, event hotline numbers for residents to contact and also an interactive map so that they could identify where the source of the noise was coming from. Okay, and has that been well received? Uh, through the chair, yes, it has, um, and we've received quite a, uh, a lot of positive feedback um, from residents that that's helped them. I guess the other concern um, I had was, you know, where does this fit in terms of regimes nationally, looking at other cities? Um, you know, there's been a, um, I know there's been a big focus on some of the changes that have been brought in in Sydney. Obviously, there's lockout laws and a range of changes that have been um, made that impact adversely on their nightlife. Um, and whilst obviously I'm very sensitive to the concerns of city residents, I also want to make sure we don't swing the pendulum too far the other way in terms of um, dampening our, our city nightlife. Have you considered the experience interstate and, and what's, where does Adelaide's uh, proposal sit? In, in that context. Through the chair. Yes, we've done some noise modelling based on uh, other capital cities and their curfews or maximum audio levels. Certainly Adelaide uh, sits well within that. We're no more restrictive than anywhere else. For example, certain premier parklands in Sydney have 10.30 p.m. curfews no matter what the event is. So. We have the flexibility within our parklands to allow for appropriate activities to run later if required and if appropriate. So we no, no more restrictive than, than Sydney. Not that Sydney is necessarily a good template <laughs> these days. No, no exactly. Uh, through the chair, yeah, no more restrictive. Okay. Um, Lord Mayor, how's that? Um, I have to say I'm not particularly supportive of what is in the, this, this um, proposal. Um, I was very concerned by uh, things that hope to achieve a reduction in late night activity. Um, I think if you put this with what's happening with licensing fees, we're just shutting down the city. Yeah. Why would we do that? And of 62 events, there were 15 complaints over a year, and of those, only seven of those complaints were things that 
we were looking after. So it was the clips or uh, what's it called now? The Super Loop 500 or it was um, the Adelaide Oval concerts, which are things that we aren't actually managing. So, so seven complaints out of 62 events over an entire year and, um, and we're basically closing everything down. And I, I'm particularly concerned that means that there are areas of the city that particularly around the events uh, that we and our event season that is growing and our events calendar is growing all the time. Um, that we're just going to make it not viable. Sydney is not a no, great no, okay. template because yeah. Sydney, no. you, you know, you try and find anywhere in Sydney after yeah. 10 o'clock, the whole city's been shut down. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I'm a firm believer that you actually need um, all sorts of entertainment. And as you said, the majority of people that use Light Square or those particular areas aren't looking for that kind of night and, and so I understand that and I'm, I'm not even particularly worried about the decibel reduction because that was very slight and that's just bringing it down you know a few notches essentially but I'm I'm very concerned about the trading hours um, particularly some of those spaces in, in and around the city and uh, that, that the intention is not to have late night activity. Um, I also, I just, I am uh, in favour of the flexible Sunday night for public holidays. Um, the um, the flexibility around the headline acts is great. Um, I I get the horrors every time the word curfew is mentioned because it just makes me feel like we're going to the dark ages. Um, and uh, you know, I thought the whole thing is about how we attract more events to our city so that we have a more dynamic sort of cultural life as opposed to saying, don't come here, we don't want your events because um, we're going to make it so difficult for you. The, the, seven, the seven complaints, I'd really like to interrogate those a little bit and just see what we could have done around those seven complaints of the 62 events in the year as opposed to actually um, putting some blanket um, uh, rules across all of them. Um, the other thing is, did the have the presenters for the events? Did you get much feedback from them around the actual um, suggestions in terms of the changes? Uh, through the chair, we did seek their feedback, and we haven't received any feedback from them. However, um, after the workshop, we will be going back to them with consultation, targeted yeah. consultation okay. again. Um, with the proposed changes to seek further feedback. Okay. Okay. So um, I think there's a lot of work that's gone into it. Um, I just am um, worried about the outcome that we're trying to achieve. Um, when, I mean, even on the has ring, remember when there was the things around Benighton Park and um, we were both saying, but we, we want there to be music festivals. We want our kids not to have to go to Melbourne every time they want to see a concert. You know, we, we do actually want a very active, very, you know, um, culturally vibrant city. And I'm, I'm scared that we're actually going in the wrong direction, particularly when you marry it up, it goes against those licensing yeah. fees and what's going to happen to our uh, nightclubs. Is that a statement or a question? Yeah. That, that, was a, that was a statement. <laughs> um, sorry. I'm just we stating are. my view because I'm answering the question, do members support the proposed changes? To and your answer is? My answer is no, I don't, okay. for those reasons. Thank you. Councillors, uh, Councillor Hyde, sorry. Are we commenting as well? Uh, yes, you're welcome to comment and also provide. Yes. Really? I heard your comment. No, I questioned. Did you? I'll let myself be. I'll let you know. Um, And that was the um, uh, perhaps the intent of the original motion was brought forward. I'm just doing what the previous council um, uh, said to do. But uh, yes, no, I can't support anything that says that um, in the slightest. Um, I've had I've had feedback from uh, uh, nightclub operators and others in the space, and um, uh, while well, I'll, I'll pass the feedback back to them, that they should have had uh, input into this process from the beginning. Um, I can tell you that they're broadly unsupportive of this. Um, as well, I suppose that there are a few things I would say when we're talking about the 62,000, uh, sorry, 62 <laughs> events and 15 complaints. I mean, those 62 events must represent, and correct me if I'm wrong, in the, in the region of 200,000 plus visitations to the city over that period. Um, and yet we've got 15 complaints. Um, it, just, it, just does, it just doesn't marry up to have this 
the level of draconian response that we've got here. Um, I'd also say as well, uh, in, in, when we're talking about comparisons to other capital cities, it says on page 261 of our, of our papers, um, on slide 37, um, the proposed changes outlined in this report are in many cases above and beyond what other capital city councils currently have in place. Um, uh, so we're, we're essentially trying to make Adelaide the quietest, the quietest city or the, or the, uh, or the city with the, the most draconian rules in that regard. So I can't support that either. Um, uh, broadly, broadly speaking, I think uh, look, it's 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 a, it's a bit schizophrenic of us to come to come uh, to this committee and then to council and approve um, sponsorship. Um, uh, grants to events, and you're not numbering in uh, uh, over, over a million, um, and yet then come and say uh, we want less late night activity. So I know I know you guys are just doing what the council has has directed and said to be prepared. I would like to think this is a new council. Um, we want more activity in the city. Certainly that's been our agenda to date, um, and uh, I I still hope that the work that's gone into this um, has obviously expanded uh, administration's understanding of events and noise in the city and what have you. I, I know Notice that although the motion only referred to the Riverbank precinct, you did expand it to include um, some of the squares as well. So I, I hope you've had a good look at that. Um, uh, and of, of course, industry consultation is always good. But um, uh, the answer is no, uh, I can't support this. I think it's a, a completely unbalanced response to a couple of complaints probably originating from North Adelaide. And I, I would encourage administration, I think when we have things like this come up, to look at um, uh, you know what other things could be put in place to to uh, mitigate noise. Not not by saying stop making noise, but um, and hopefully this has come from from your engaging technical experts and that sort of thing. But how can we uh, reduce the noise at the point that it's an issue, not at the point that it's made? Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Councillor Murray. Uh, yes. Look, um, I can understand the concerns that Councillor saying that, but that counts, previous councils time and time again have been battling with a, um, a problem of the constant noise going up the river valley. Uh, I agree that I think this may be going a smidge too far in the, the time of the concerts and I would rather look at things like, you know, reducing the decibel level, reducing the bass, doof, 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 mm -hmm. um, moving the stages to face back towards the city where there are less um, Less residents. Well, even that's that's difficult now, isn't it? Or down the river. Because uh, I can assure you, they probably do come from North Adelaide, and they probably do look like only a few. But if you're living in North Adelaide and you're a councillor on the city council, you know that for each one of those, there are many, many people that have been disturbed, and they aren't, as the Sam said on the radio today, old people. They're young people with babies. They're the um, sick children at the Women's and Children's Hospital. Um, old people, in fact, are more likely to put up with it. Um, so it's just... It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, but North Adelaide now is a suburb full of young families with small babies and small children. And uh, they are genuinely being disturbed by, by that. It used to be an older suburb, but the demography is quite different now. We have 70% rental. And as I think we talked in the previous council, a lot of those are young families that are laying buying a house. Um, so it is not an easy thing just to say get rid of this. I think we should, if we throw the whole thing out then we're just back to square one and we have ignored a large residential suburb. And just because it's North Adelaide, I shudder when the other councils say well, it's just sort of old people from North Adelaide. That is such an ignorant thing to say. Uh, the way that the River Valley works, you can be in one house and not hear a thing and you can be in the next house and it's like the concert is um, is rattling, well, the concert is literally rattling your windows. Um, so to say that there's no problem it is, is disingenuous. There is a problem. Perhaps this isn't the solution. Um, I think we need to go back and look at something that um, that satisfies everybody. But I hate to hear councillors say it's just North Adelaide, it's just old people, there's only a couple of people complaining. That is not the case. North Adelaide has a very big problem with the noise. We don't police them. So Frenchy, so shit, was so loud. I live on North Terrace, so I don't hear anything because I'm fake, my heart's faced the side of that. But I could hear that like it was a party in my front veranda. And the whole of North Adelaide rang us that night. I don't blame them. When we our staff went down there to speak to them, um, 
the people that are running these concerts do not appear to know about decibel levels or any. Be reduced a little bit, um, but not perhaps as quite as much as this. But do not leave this committee meeting thinking there's no problem. It's only two people complaining. It is not. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Kerrigan, Councillor Simpson. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Look, it's comment time, so I'd like to support what Councillor Moran has said. I think that it. Um, I think that we we have to keep in mind that yes, it's it's right to be concerned about. Uh, driving activities and business and nine life away. That is a fair concern. But on the other hand, we, we have to manage the activities and the events that we have in the city. Um, and we, we need a framework within which to manage those events. Um, and I don't know that adjusting that framework necessitates a, a driving away. You know, I think that there is a level of discretion that a lot of, that, a lot of events providers have. Um, you know, I was walking down uh, Rundle, uh, Varden Lane, one of the um, one of the events that was held in the daytime there, and there was an extraordinarily loud um, sort of DJ playing. It it was just mind boggling how loud this was. Now, I don't see that that event would have not taken place had we set uh, a particular guideline around that sound. They would have just turned it down uh, to a certain extent. And with regards to complaints, you know, you speak to constituents. Um, I know it, this report has just outlined a certain number of parks. The East Parklands has not been identified. And I'll perhaps just, just a comment as to why that has not been identified. Uh, through the Chair, uh, the East Parklands and all the noise modelling that we've done, um, the impacts to surrounding areas are minimal um, throughout the event season. Um, it really comes down to the type of activity that is being held in a location and the suitability of that activity for a certain location. Thanks. Um, and, and, and that's the thing. So, I, I mean, I've spoken to constituents in the East Parklands who have been troubled by noise, and it strikes me that there are constituents, when they see a big public event, they may not make a noise complaint uh, because they see it as a public event. They probably think there's nothing we can do about it. Um, it doesn't stop them from being troubled by it. Um, so whilst on, 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 on balance, uh, you know, I'm inclined to say, yeah, look, maybe this in its current form, maybe we can do better. We, we definitely should not be throwing away the opportunity to properly manage uh, events and noise because whilst we want to attract events, we want to attract buzz and nightlife, we want to also attract people to live in the city. Um, and it is not encouraging of people to live in the city if they are faced with an increasing, we've got a 50% increase in the number of nighttime events um, in, in just one year. We do not encourage that uptake of population in the city. We get a reputation for loud noise. So I think that it's a balancing act, but I would just urge caution and, and just bolster what Councillor Moran said. Let's not throw this baby, the baby out on this, uh, on this management. Thank you, Councillor Sims and Councillor Martin. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, look, I, I have real concerns um, about this as well, similar to the, um, the Lord Mayor. I do agree with Councillor Kira, it is a balancing act, um, absolutely. And, you know, residents in our city are a very important stakeholder, no question. But actually, this doesn't address some of the common issues that I've had that have been raised by residents um, in terms of um, residential areas and noise. Um, what I worry that it does do is potentially have a chilling effect on um, our night economy at a time when it's already under significant pressure because of change to changes to liquor licensing. And you know, I gave the example of Sydney before. I mean, that's a city that you know had a um, a reputation as a vibrant, exciting place, and it's now become the killjoy capital of Australia because there's been a systematic approach in terms of liquor licensing. Um, regulations and a range of other things that have had a, a combined effect of, of dampening um, the nightlife in the city. So I just want to make sure we don't go down that path in, in Adelaide. Um, so whilst I understand the intention, uh, intention and whilst I think it's really important to consider the residential experience and look at this, I am concerned that this maybe goes a little bit too far. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Councillor Martin.
Uh, a couple of questions first, if I may, Chair. Um, uh, the Lord Mayor talked about there being only seven complaints. Is it not the case that with events, particularly events like uh, you know, the Royal Croquet Club and so on, that Council doesn't actually field the complaints? Complainants go to the number which is operated by the event organiser. Is that not correct? Uh, through the Chair, uh, Councillor Martin, yes, the events do record the complaints, but it's also a requirement of their event licence that they provide us with the number of complaints that they're receiving. And, and isn't it the case that some of those events uh, have not answered their phone? That some of the complaints are that people ring and ring and ring and can't get through and can't register a complaint? Through the Chair, yes, that is correct. Thank you. Now, also, uh, the Lord Mayor made much about those seven complaints, but the consultation findings, um, it was a target of consultation. How many people were consulted? Through the Chair, the recent consultation went out with the City Rates Notice, so all uh, residents and businesses in the City, as well as uh, targeted consultation with many event organisers. So it's about 38% of those who responded, according to the document, who say that reviewing finishing times is an important thing. Yeah. Look, I don't, I don't think people understand this document. Uh, there's this emotive response about shutting down the City. Nothing of the sort is happening. Uh, what this document makes clear is that people don't understand that the major events, the international acts, uh, uh, WOMAD and the like, are not controlled by council. They are state government issues. And so anything we're discussing here has no impact on Adelaide Oval and the big international concerts there. It has no impact on WOMAD, which has big international acts. Um, it has no impact on the Superloop or any of the big bands that appear there. We are out of that picture. We are talking about single events, uh, generally single events and sequential events like Festival and Fringe in areas where there have been consistent complaints. And I, I take up Councillor Moran's point uh, and Councillor Kira's that there is a stream of complaints that come to uh, resident uh, uh, councillors um, about these issues when they are going on. Um, and, you know, the uh, pinky flat problem has been one that local residents are very familiar with. Um, they, they are complaining about it for all of the, the reasons that Council Moran mentions. There is a funneling effect. And this document here pays attention to that and notes particularly that where there is an impact on noise and the way in which it travels, this document actually sets out some fine detail to impart two events, including the way in which the stage should be faced based on the experience of uh, council officers. It sets out detail about the way in which people submit noise management plans, the timeline, which is now 28 days. It evens out the guidelines, reduces the rules. So we're cutting red tape with this document. Uh, additionally, it uh, refines all of the confusion around noise bonds. There are now clear definitions. The number of definitions of events has been reduced. Um, and it's also consistent with the Parklands Event Management Plan, which said, and, and the council agreed to this, that all events, new events coming to the city on those lands which aren't controlled by council will close at midnight unless otherwise agreed by, by council. This is absolutely consistent with everything that council has done. Now, the other excellent part about uh, uh, this document is that it's already been up to consultation. People have provided their views. All of our ratepayers have been asked. And in the face of that, people say, oh, only seven complaints. Well, these are the rate plans, and they're telling you this is a problem. And I'm telling you that the people of North Adelaide say this noise is a problem. The people of North Adelaide aren't saying let's not have events. They're quite happy to have those. All they're asking is that those events cease at a reasonable hour to enable them to go about their lives. And let me tell you, as somebody who lives in the area, the noise, the volume at three in the morning makes it incredibly difficult to sleep, particularly if you need to get up to work the next day. So, I, you know, I just urge everyone to consider the whole of this document, which was worthwhile, and not just go for this emotive, let's not shut down the city crap um, uh, line. Thank you. Well, maybe you've already spoken. Um, 
Uh, you can ask a question if you wish. Can I clarify, please? I know you said that the consultation went out through the right, right notice, but how many respondees did we actually have? Wasn't it only 50 people that responded? So, so the information or the data that we've collected is from 50 respondents. But when we go out to consultation, you're going to go direct targeted consultation or are you going to go out to everybody as well? Uh, through the chair, we will be going out through your say um, using that platform to see the consultation. And we'll also be going back to those people that had responded to the initial consultation and once again to the event organisers as well. Thank you. And um, I'm not allowed to make a comment, am I? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Councillor Kira, questions? Just a yes. question. Um, so, okay, let's take a specific example. So, Frenchy, so chic. I went to that. It was a great event. But um, Good for you, can you, um, Don, um, can you tell us, do you have any, uh, not trying to put you on the spot, but uh, do you have any sense of, say, take that example, um, would you know roughly what sort of decibels they're operating at? Would you have any idea? And would this change? Would this change? Because I think they, they had to finish at 12 midnight from, from memory anyway. Um, so this change is a, what, what is it, a five or 10 decibel reduction in their, in their allowed output. Um, would this drive them away? Through the chair, uh, we maintain the position that any event currently in Pinky Flat would not be unduly affected. It wouldn't alter Sir Frenchy Sir Sheik's uh, running time based on the previous years. Uh, we did some noise work with the organisers this year to try and improve their operation, which was very successful. Uh, it influenced uh, part of our work around stage positioning within Pinky Flat. So based upon uh, the reports from that event, it shouldn't unduly impact them or drive them anywhere else. And just to follow up, are there any events that you get the sense would actually uh, say, no, we're not going to come here again because of the change in decibel, the change in house proposed in this? In this? Uh, through the chair, um, from looking at the current events that are held within the city, um, our view is that none of the events will be impacted by these proposed changes. Um, I think it's important to, if I can clarify, the changes that we're proposing from four pinky flat just aren't as a result of the feedback on the guidelines. It's actually an outcome of um, trialling and testing events in that site and working out how noise travels from that location. Um, it's quite unique compared to other parkland event sites. The noise just doesn't travel in one direction. Um, we're not sure if it's the built form or the water, but depending on the event, it can travel in any number of directions. So due to the fact that it's really hard to manage the noise from that site and every event that uses that site has found that, um, that is why we are recommending that the noise levels are reduced from, uh, sorry, the operating times are reduced from 3 a.m. to midnight to just as a mechanism to help um, manage the noise. It's also, if I can also add, um, we actually haven't had any interest in that Pinky Flat site for any major events or concerts. Um, the site isn't really that suited to concerts. So if we did receive a request, we would actually work with those event organisers to find a location in the city <coughs> that could go till 3 a.m. and have a concert and still continue to support the late night economy. Thank you. Councillor Martin, you had another question? A question, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, by uh, agreeing to what's before us tonight, we're not agreeing to it. We're simply going under public consultation. Is that correct? No, I can't answer this question. Um, we are currently running a workshop and we're responding to a workshop to administration. That's all we're doing. There is no recommendation here whatsoever. So all our feedback and our remarks have been recorded by administration. That's all that's happened at this stage. So, so I'm clear. Um, is there another step in this process that you will come back to us and say, do you want to go to public consultation or is that the purpose of this discussion? I get the CEO to answer that question. Um, thank you, Chair. So the intent was, based on your feedback tonight, um, whether we felt we could amend these guidelines and go out for formal consultation and bring that back to you 
members uh, for consideration, but based on the feedback tonight, we'll go away, give it some thought. Um, if I could just say, say one thing, um, the feedback we've had consistently from event organisers who work both here and nationally and internationally is that coming to Adelaide and, and um, holding events within the city of Adelaide is actually um, one of the um, easiest cities to do business in. That's because we provide certainty and clarity either through um, standard operating procedures around noise or through our um, Adelaide events um, planning, um, which enables them to be able to know that they've got a range of different spaces, a range of different places, and some clarity and certainty um, about um, what they can expect if they do business here in Adelaide. Um, so I did just want members to um, be clear that that's consistent. And one other comment, um, we do have a range of um, projects coming through in the coming weeks um, because the other thing that our event organisers say all the time is there's still other um, pieces of policy that they're asking us um, to work with them on so that we can continue to be um, a leading city um, when it comes to hosting events. Members, if there's no other burning questions, we're sitting on 35 minutes on this item. To, to Just uh, so that I can understand what's happened. So Director Mockler is saying that as a result of the conversation, the comments of the Lord Mayor and others, this document is going back to be amended and that it will come to us again in the fall. That's correct. So if and I would urge councillors in the meanwhile that if you have any other feedback you'd like to feed to the administration or ask any questions, we'll have the opportunity outside the community to do that. Uh, and ask any questions. With that in mind, is there any burning questions that we need to do? I know, Councillor, you haven't spoken, but would you like to speak? Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> simple um, question, yeah. simple answer. I can only jump so far uh, at my age. Um, just as uh, I had a conversation with one, uh, one of our ratepayers, and, and he's in this space about uh, events, etc. And he made the comment that uh, uh, you know technology now is such that we are able to, at a reasonably low expense for large events, uh, able to measure in real time uh, the, the decibels or the sound that coming out of events at various uh, positions. What I'm what I'm getting at is that um, I lived off Hackney Road, just up from the zoo, and at six o'clock on Sunday mornings, I would hear the lions and the, uh, the apes, etc. Got a still morning. The point is, at, at different times, the, 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 the noise levels are different simply because of the way the environment is. And the point is, is that if we're measuring, we're going to get real-time uh, information, and that way they're going to adjust themselves uh, according to the, you know, and can also limit them using those uh, those devices, and therefore uh, still comply, but comply at times where you know that they may be a problem because most of the time, if it's a bit uh, noise or the wind is blowing a different way, that doesn't occur. But that then gives you a, certainly a rules around that, but it also gives you the flexibility to work around those rules in a way that you can do that in real time and therefore still uh, you know, uh, uh, have your event, uh, but not actually do the disturbing because you're, you're informed in the way that you can actually adjust uh, your event. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, members, any other questions? I might just impart one remark um, to see if it's something that you've considered. I think from an intergenerational perspective, moving forward, every built form that occurs in the city, if we are looking at being an event city, are we making it a recommendation through to the planning uh, rules to be able to provide double glazing, triple glazing, et cetera, to make recommendation around building structure so we can deal with noise in the future as we attract more people to the city? Uh, we might not have the current infrastructure and the current housing we've got to manage noise, but for the future, are we making it a recommendation in planning? I didn't see anything in the document that would potentially consider that. Um, through the chair, so um, some work was done a couple of years ago with the planning department and um, other departments across uh, state government and local government to make sure that um, on recognition of becoming a UNESCO city of music, um, that all our policy mechanisms, state and local, enabled music to be at the heart of uh, what we do here. Um, a 90-day project was held um, and various recommendations um, to uh, either ease legislation or um, strengthen some of the planning requirements have been implemented as a result um, of that. Oh, Shanti, what was that, two years ago, three years ago? Um, to make sure that our live music reputation uh, wasn't diminished. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, members. So this will come back to you um, after the feedback has been taken on board and I'm definitely going to come through a committee structure so it'll be another opportunity for council members to comment and ask questions before it goes to the council for the final decision. 
Thank you very much for your presentation and for your time. We will move on to the next item. Um, we have items to consider in confidence of exclusion to the public, items 8.1, 9.1 and 9.2. If I can have a member please move uh, to exclude item 7.1, Councillor Martin. No, it's, it's item 8.1, Chair, and I'm moving that this matter be heard in public. Okay, so uh, do you have a seconder? I think I do, yes. Okay, would you, um, would you like to state your reasons? Yes, certainly, Chair. Look, this matter came before Council in February. It has already been in Council. Um, I moved that the funding allocation for this strategic event be provided. Councillor Sims moved an amendment. There was a great debate uh, in public about all of the issues. Um, and as I recall, Team Adelaide voted it down. Uh, you spoke uh, strongly against the Chair. Which and one is that? Sorry, Councillor. This is 8.1 strategic event. It's, um, it's a matter that's been canvassed quite publicly um, and now that um, it was voted down, it's being brought back for our approval with a cloak of secrecy over it now. It was actually not voted down, Councillor. It was voted down. No, it was not. You just fake it. I've got a record of it. It's not voted down. I'll just check. No, it was, it was. Well, it depends what you're checking. You're checking oh. your newsletter? Uh, I'm checking the council records. <laughs> okay. Well, my recollection, and I think Councillor oh, Sims, is, is it the vote of So we'll, we'll deal with but this. But look, the point, the point that I'm making is that this has already been in the public arena. We talked about it at length. And now a, a, a cloak of secrecy is thrown over. So what I'll do, uh, thank you for uh, explaining that. I might get a comment from the administration to why it needs to be heard in confidence, and then council can make a decision accordingly. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, Thank you through the chair. Obviously, if you look at the link of the correspondence being provided, there's been a request there um, for some commercial and confidence uh, details. This is still subject to potentially international negotiation, um, potentially multiple jurisdictions across the globe. Considering um, this event, I think there is further information in the letter provided um, which indicates potential commercial model that requires some commercial, that has commercial sensitivities. And I'll refer to the letter attached in the brief. But, but look, I've, I've seen the letter attached. My recollection is that the only thing in the contents of the letter that is different from our debate is that the author of the letter is asking for the matter to be heard in confidence. So, Councillor, I've heard you. There's been a seconder to the motion. We have heard the administration provide remarks to why it needs to be held in confidence. I'm going to give the opportunity to seconder to speak and I'm going to put this to the vote and that if, if it's successful, the matter will be heard in public. If it's not, it will fail and then we'll move the motion again to exclude the public. Councillor Sims. Thank you, Chair. Look, I think we should only uh, hear matters in confidence when it is absolutely uh, essential for us to do so. Um, and this particular matter is one that we have already discussed in an open uh, council chamber. Um, and in light of that fact, um, I see no reason why it cannot be discussed uh, in public, in front of the community, um, to give them the opportunity to hear about um, our discussions. Um, I think we shouldn't be going down the path of bringing something that has been discussed in the public domain previously into um, confidence, particularly on the, the basis of um, a request from a third party, when often this tends to be a standard approach that certain third parties take um, in their engagement with um, council. There have been some circumstances of late where matters have been heard in confidence, um, which quite frankly I think should not have been heard in confidence because the information could have been quite easily gleaned um, through uh, any member of the public who is uh, familiar with Google. So um, I think in this circumstance we should have a discussion um, in the public domain so that we can have an informed debate in the community. Thank you, Councillor. Any other councillor would like to make a comment or ask any questions with regards to this item? Be it that there's none, I'll hand over to you to sum up, Councillor. Oh, I think I made my position clear. Thank you, so summed up. I'll put the vote. Um, councillor Martin has moved to hear this item 8.1 in public. The ones that support that in favour, please raise your hands. 
the ones that are against that is that has failed so i'll ask another council member to move the exclusion councillor canol seconded by councillor hyde any further discussion on this item be it that there's none i'll put that all those in favor all those against that item is carried um, do we need to move three exclusions or one <coughs> move the uh item 9.1 to order to exclude uh on this item moved by the lord mayor seconded by councillor moran any discussion? Sorry, Councillor Martin, go ahead. Yeah, look, uh, I just want to reiterate uh, this matter relates to uh, um, uh, ratepayer concerns. Um, we are a publicly elected council uh, with public assets, and I believe that the public has a right to hear what we're discussing. Again, it's just a cloak of secrecy when I think there's a higher standard ex expected of us. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Sims. Yes, I also uh, wish to speak against this being heard in confidence. I think when we're talking about uh, assets such as this, we should be having discussions in uh, public space. I think the public has a right to know. Again, it's about ensuring we can have uh, informed discussion within the community and that we as elected members are um, aware of the views of the community that we represent. So um, I don't support this being heard in confidence. Okay, thank you. Councillors um, who apologise, was moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Moran. Any further discussion? I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Item 9.2, order to exclude the public with regards to uh, item visitor information centre feasibility study. Um, again, can I have a mover please? Moved by Councillor Hyde, seconded by Councillor Canole. Is there any further discussion on this item? I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That item is carried. Uh, with that in mind, I'd ask.
And I declare the meeting closed at 8.35 p.m. Thank you very much.